Okay, we're okay, going to go, go ahead, ahead and begin. begin. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Welcome everyone. Welcome, everyone. I am Sharon, Sharon Green Middleton, Middleton, Vice President, President of, the of, the of the City Council, Representative for the Sixth Council, Council District, District and Chairperson, Chairperson for the Economic, for the Economic and Community, and Community Development, Development Committee. Committee. This, this afternoon we will hear the following bills. Bill number 21-0117, Termination of Administrative Parking Restrictions, Peak Hour Parking Restrictions. Bill number 23-0407, Zoning Discontinuance or abandonment of non-conforming use reporting. And this bill we're going to hear first because it's just a uh, voting session and we'll get that out of the way. And then additionally, the following bill has been canceled pending rescheduling and that's bill 23-0435, zoning code modifications. So let's go ahead and vote out of the way since we do have a quorum here, but let me first do, get to, through the intendants. Um, present at this moment, we have um, Mark Con members of the committee, Mark Conway of the 4th District, Ryan Dorsey of the 3rd District, Odette Ramos of the 14th District, you, and Robert Stokes of the 12th District. And Councilman Bullock is on his way. He is a member of, uh, another uh, a commission and uh, we'll be here shortly and we also have a uh, council member that's visiting online and that's councilman james torrance representatives you, from the mayor's office we have tiffany macklin deputy director of legislation of the, what did i say Oh, I'm sorry. Representative of the Office of the President, Tiffany Macklin, Deputy Director for Legislation, and representative from the Mayor's Office. Thank you, Tyler. Tyler Shinella, Mayor's Office Governmental Relations. And we probably have seen Tyler working in the Office of um, Equity. And he has, and oh, okay. <laughs> And now we, he has uh, moved on to the Office of Governmental Relations and uh, welcome aboard. Okay, just as a refresher for the um, voting session, I'm just going to find where I, oh, here we go. Okay, I want to just read this to refresh your memory because I think we do have to vote on amendments as well. So this was bill number 23-0407, zoning discontinuance or abandonment of nonconforming use reporting for the purpose of establishing a process for a person to report to the zoning administrator that a non-conforming use or any part of that use has been discontinued for 12 consecutive months or actually abandoned. And the bill was introduced on June 26, 2023. The sponsor was Council Member Ramos. Um, we had favorable reports from City Solicitor, Planning Commission Department, Department of Housing, BMZA, um, BDC and the Department of Transportation had no objection. And uh, we did have amendments. And we're going, I think we, uh, those amendments were explained. So we're just going to go ahead and vote unless there's someone that wants to read and go over. Uh, Councilwoman Ramos, did you want to? Uh, review the amendments again. Uh, yeah, Madam Chair, thank you very much. Um, and thank you to the committee. Just as a reminder to the committee during our last hearing, well, <clears throat> just a reminder in terms of what this bill does, it um, adds um, uh, uh, another, pro not another process, but a more in-depth process for um, reporting and opportunity for residents to report on um, whether or not a building is still in um, non-conformance. Um, and then remember that we had a dialogue about whether or not to add 
um, non um, conditional use, that a conditional use would then also you go through the same process. Um, we did have a lot of discussion with the law department, um, Councilman Dorsey, myself, and others, and decided that um, it was uh, after all of that discussion that we would need to put in a separate bill um, in order to have this process that's outlined in this bill uh, to be um, also for conditional uses. So we will do that at another time. And uh, so this bill is exactly how you saw it in the last, um, uh, the last meeting. Uh, and then the amendments are um, just changing some wording um, from the law department and then also from DHCD, they wanted to um, have some clarification as to a report structure that they would um, be having on their website. Um, so with that, Madam Chair, um, unless there's any questions, I think we're ready. Thank you. I'm, uh, just, checking. I'm just checking something real quick. So what we're going, to, we're going to go, I know there was an amendment from housing and an amendment from the law department, and I think we can vote on them together. So um, we'll go ahead that way unless someone finds that that's different. So is there a motion to recommend the amendment that was, pre the amendment that was presented from the law department and housing? So moved. So moved by Ramos, second by Dorsey, Chair Middleton, yes. Uh, Bullock, excused absence. Conway yes. is a yes. Dorsey, yes. yes. Glover, absent. Ramos yes. is a yes. And Stokes yes. is a yes. Okay, is there a motion to rec recommend the bill favorable as amended? So moved. So moved by Ramos, second by Dorsey. Middleton, yes. Uh, Conway yes. is a yes. Dorsey yes. is a yes. Ramos yes. is a yes. And Stokes yes. is a yes. Uh, so this bill will move to second reader at the next council meeting. Okay, moving back. to um, bill number 21-0117, termination of administrative parking restrict regulations, peak hour parking restrictions. For the purpose of terminating peak hour parking restrictions, number one on the 100 through 800 blocks of East, East uh, 33rd Street, number two on the 27 through 3600 blocks of Hill and Road, and number three on the 3300 through 3500 blocks of the Alameda, number four on the 25 through 32 blocks of Lock Raven Boulevard, and number five on the 2900 through 4300 blocks of Greenmont Avenue. Uh, this bill was introduced on August 16th, 2021. Uh, the sponsor of this bill is Councilwoman Ramos. Uh, Councilwoman Ramos, you, would you like to comment before we go to agency reports? Uh, yes, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to the committee, um, and thank you, Madam Chair, for scheduling this again. We had a hearing on this bill about a year and a half ago. Um, the idea is that uh, there are um, several um, streets in my district that are basically highways, if, for lack of a better word, uh, where there's a lot of um, speeding and traffic. And uh, one of the best ways to reduce that is by removing um, peak hour parking restrictions. Peak hour restrictions are when uh, a resident has to move their car at 7 a.m. to 9 a.m. or from 4 to 6 p.m. so that there can be two lanes of traffic uh, for rush hour um, traffic. Um, 
you know, after uh, COVID, lots of things have changed in terms of where people are um, driving, going to work, et cetera. Um, but we, you know, as a result, we're actually seeing a lot more speeding and a lot more problems. Um, so uh, one of the ways to be able to address this is by narrowing those lanes, by allowing for people to keep their cars there uh, and have one lane of traffic both ways, uh, so that, or two, depending on where you are, like uh, Lock Raven and, and Hillen. Um, and uh, so we've been working on this for a while. At our last hearing, uh, DOT reported that they were doing and finishing up a, a study to see where uh, these uh, types of um, removals of these peak parking restrictions could go. They started with my district. I believe that they've finished the rest of the city. Uh, and um, we still have not seen that the parking restrictions that I have asked for uh, came have come off, so I needed to have this hearing again to uh, continue the conversation um, and have uh, people involved. I do have people, I believe, online uh, ready to testify as well, um, because this is uh, such a big issue. Traffic calming is one of the biggest things that I complaints that I get in my district, and so um, this is one way to do it. You'll see on the amendments that we've added a few streets, um, Falls Road in particular, um, the rest of Greenmount Avenue. Um, and just clarity around 33rd Street. Um, and uh, so um, today that we'll continue this discussion um, around uh, removal of peak parking restrictions. I do think it is something that we wanna look at citywide. Um, this bill is specific to my district as well as I've got a couple of streets in the, um, in the 7th District. Um, and the fourth district, there's one uh, side of Greenmount Avenue. Um, so I want to just, um, you know, uh, have this discussion um, and see where um, DOT has, is. I believe that they will have a presentation about their study um, as well as where we're falling on um, the, the streets that I have specifically asked for. Um, and uh, thank you, Madam Chair, for the opportunity to have the, the hearing again. Thank you. Any questions to the sponsor? Um, council member uh, Stokes. Um, uh, Councilwoman o Ramos, yes. this is not a block that has street sweeping, is it? I, um, I know you're talking about the peak hours, but was there any sh mechanical street sweep coming through there also? Yeah, so um, the way, th so these are streets that don't have the signage that says you have to move your cars. But as you know, there's a voluntary program where um, all of the streets are swept at least once a quarter. And that, I don't know whether that's done during peak hour parking. Um, I guess it varies. Um, but these are streets that don't have the signage that says you have to move from one side to the other. Like I didn't do St. Paul Street for that reason. Um, as, as you know, we share parts of St. Paul Street and that has, um, street sweeping during peak parking, and it's all signage there. So, um, so that's a good question, but that's why I didn't include St. Paul Street. Yep. Um, looking through this, I see there is um, some communication with Chum and and in communication from Guilford Association. Are there any other associations involved in the streets that you have listed? Yes, um, in the last hearing, we, I believe, also got communication from the ABLE Improvement Association for 33rd Street. Um, we got a letter from the Guilford Association regarding Greenmount Avenue. Um, the Hamden Community Council has been very involved, although we don't have a letter from them um, on the Falls Road. Um, and I could get one if that's what the committee desires. Um, and we heard from Chum today on the, the streets that are um, listed in this bill for Coldstream Homestead Montebello. I think it's important to include in the uh, file a letter from Hamden Association if it affects them. Yep, thank you. Mm -hmm. And uh, any other questions before I move on? Councilman Stokes? No. Uh, oh, and I recognize um, Councilman Glover uh, member of the committee. Um, I, I guess I have one quest, burning question before we move on. Um, I know that this particular ordinance bill pertains um, particularly to 
areas in the 14th district. And I know when you put in an ordinance, it, and as you also said, it affects the, it eventually will affect the entire city. And I'm just wondering why you would do an ordinance this way when um, you could have, you know, separate dialogue and communication pertaining to your specific district. Mm -hmm. um, thank you, Madam Chair, uh, for that question. Uh, yes, you're, you're correct. Normally, we wouldn't um, be able to legislate traffic calming, right? That's not necessarily a role that we can play. Um, in this particular case, um, we are able to do um, peak parking restrictions. Um, and we actually have been in, my uh, staff and I have been in contact with DOT uh, for the whole year, basically trying to work this out. And it got to a point where um, I haven't been able to get results, um, which is surprising, frankly, because I work with DOT very um, uh, well in terms of the, a lot of the things that we've been able to do in my district. And part of that is just the worry from um, MTA. I don't know if they submitted a letter, but the um, MTA was concerned about um, some of the streets um, as, as well. So um, I think the mayor's office and DOT will testify about um, some of those uh, issues. Um, but you are right, Madam Chair, uh, normally uh, this uh, wouldn't come before you, it would be, or the committee, it would be something that we would work through together. Um, and uh, with, the, with DOT, um, it has just you know, come to a point where I think there's a lot of people interested in this. Um, we wanted to have a much more public dialogue about it and, um, and work this through. Um, I will say, given the, the work that we have done leading up to this hearing, um, the uh, mayor's office will testify um, that they have submitted, I don't know if they submitted it to the committee or just to me, um, that uh, the majority of these will be removed um, and that we will have a separate meeting uh, regarding the concerns about the, what the MTA is concerned about um, in order to um, move forward. So um, if the, you know, I, I'm, um, I'm okay with that agreement, um, and so I know the mayor's office and DOT will testify to that. But I do think that it's worth a dialogue here in this hearing because of the idea of peak parking restrictions being removed across the city and what that would look like and what a, maybe a process in the future would look like for, for DOT um, uh, as well. Okay, and I just, um, you know, as I was looking over this bill and I kind of, uh, thought about streets in uh, the 6th District, which I represent. And, you know, I have areas, Liberty Heights, um, Rice of Town Road, um, Park Heights Avenue, which fall parts of the, my part of Falls Road. All these are like gateways that uh, people that during peak hours come in and out of the city from, uh, whether they live in the county and work in the city or vice versa, they use these routes to get in and out of the city to, uh, so we don't have extreme traffic, you know, congestions. And approving this bill, I would like to know if the, would this mean that we're improving this for the whole city without any, uh, communication with the other associations, homeowners, so on, that live on these other streets? Would this be a blanket approval? Um, Law Department, you, could you, is that something you could answer right now? My, my view, I'm Michelle Toth on behalf of the Law Department. Thank you. My view is that this only pertains to the streets. Yeah, get closer. There you go. The streets listed in the bill, it wouldn't be a blanket approval for the whole city. Okay, I, I needed that clarification. <laughs> okay. Um, so we're at this point, are there any other questions before we move on to hear what um, others have to say? Yes, uh, Councilman Conway. Councilman Dorsey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, my question, um, I guess, for the for the sponsor is, um, how how does this affect um, travel and transportation 
outside of your district. Um, so I would imagine if you begin to, of course, slow down traffic coming down um, Greenmount, because we share Greenmount, um, that of course would then slow down traffic, which is great, create more safety, which we want. Um, but how does it affect everything else going um, north or south um, through those neighborhoods and its impact on traffic and, and flow? Sure. So, um, you know, obviously people would just, you know, there'll be signage that people would have to pull over because there's parking in the front. And we have that on 33rd Street um, because we do have removal of peak parking restrictions um, from a uh, city over to um, Lake Montebello. And uh, so um, we, uh, so it definitely slows down traffic because you just have to turn in. And there needs to be better signage, honestly, in that specific um, uh, intersection. So there would be proper signage to, to, to have people slow down and, and that they have to go through. Um, what's happening now in Greenmount Avenue is we have a, uh, a um, bump out outside of uh, Pete's Grill on 3200 block of Greenmount Avenue because the fire trucks weren't able to get out and go because um, people were parked there. So now we've actually blocked that lane anyway. Um, and so people and the buses have to come in um, anyway, so it just slows down traffic. Yes, it's a bit of being people have to be careful, um, which we want them to be on the road. Um, now, I will say that Green Mountain is one of the concerns for MTA because the red line, it's now called the red line. Don't ask me why East West is also being called the red line and North South, but that's a different issue. Um, is um, the high, the, the, the most um, ridership in the state. And uh, so, my challenge with, um, you know, what, what, what MTA is saying is we don't want to slow down that bus. Um, what I'm saying is if you, you know, you have enough room to be able to pull in and you have to anyway because of what we've just done on Greenmount. Um, but they also, as you know, because we share Greenmount Avenue and York Road, that they're um, looking to do that north-south corridor study to see whether we have light rail or rapid bus anyway. The question that I have not gotten an answer to, which I think you would agree with me on, and correct me if I'm wrong, is they haven't given us a timeline. We just don't know when that's gonna occur. And so the fact that my residents want traffic calming because I've had um, two or three times where somebody has hit somebody's fence, you know, and destroyed their side of the building and all of that, that there needs to be some way to calm traffic on Greenmount. Um, so the whole goal is to slow down traffic um, but I, I'm just, you know, answering your question by also t letting you know that MTA has um, some concerns as well. But I'm not sure that I, um, we, we haven't had a specific conversation about that in terms of a timeline because it doesn't make sense to me why we're holding up something that the residents want if we don't even know when the north-south corridor is even going to occur. Sure. Yeah, I appreciate that. And, um, yeah, I, I think there's definitely concerns about speeding along Know, York and the Green Mountain. Otherwise, uh, it is effectively a highway. It's not really safe to cross at any point along those streets. Um, so safety is a, is a major factor there. I just want to make sure as we think about the changes, um, because if we do this by law, it's law. And you know, we got to rewrite law in order to change tra traffic patterns um, that, that we're thinking about um, the sort of logistics of those changes. And it, it comes to mind for me the North-South study and um, all the work that we put into in partnership with the state um, and considering the transit line, uh, which is now the red bus line, um, not to be confused with the East-West. Right, exactly. Um, it'll eventually be some other color if we consider some other mode of, uh, of transit. But um, in looking at that line, whether or not it would be uh, multiple lanes and whether or not there's an opportunity for that bus or light rail or heavy rail um, to allow room for traffic. Um, and so being that it's already so narrow and um, the impact that that has on the ability for transit to move north-south, um, I just want to make sure we're thinking about um, that flow of traffic because we want people on transit. I think it's healthy for the city. It's good for, uh, it's good for people on buses, but also good for traffic if less people are on the road. So, it, it, you know, weighing that I think is important and just want to make sure that um, as DOT is evaluating what they, you know, eventually recommend in partnership with MTA, that we're thinking about those pieces, um, 
you know, thoughtfully. So yeah, yeah. no, and I appreciate that. If I may answer, uh, Madam Chair, yeah. I um, the that's uh, basically we've uh, come with, to a compromise on this, where um, I've gotten a memo in writing, and again, I don't know if the committee has it, but they've committed to removing all of the peak parking restrictions that we've wanted except for above, between 35th Street and 43rd Street on Greenmount Avenue, um, and um, except for 33rd Street until we have more of that kind of conversation, which is exactly what you know, you've done. And that we wouldn't vote this out today, the bill would still be sort of floating out there, but that we've agreed that everything that my residents have wanted and Councilman Torrance and I have worked on on the Hamden side occurs and that we have a broader conversation about 33rd Street and Green Mountain Avenue with the residents about what's happening on, with the MTA, um, what, you know, res, that kind of thing. So, so just to let you know where we are on that, yeah. Thanks. So added, um, so we make note, we definitely need um, something in writing from the Hamden community and also Medfield. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, and I do want to recognize uh, Councilman Bullock has um, returned from his previous meeting and uh, member of the committee that has joined us. Then we'll hear from Councilman Dorsey and then back to Councilman Stokes and then we'll listen um, to the agency reports. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to note on background, this is not the first time we've done exactly this. We had a bill of exactly the same nature last term that was put forth by myself and Councilwoman Clark that removed all of the peak hours parking restrictions on Hartford Road all the way from Baltimore County to uh, St. Lowe Drive on um, both directions of Hartford Road. We didn't pass that bill because uh, the council, because the Department of Transportation was able to and willing to come to uh, amenable terms over that with me and Councilwoman Clark uh, but, you know, as the law department's report here evidences that we actually have the authority to do this. Um, and, uh, you know, sometimes putting in the bill just creates the leverage, uh, trying to create an, an amenable outcome where you don't have to use a law to do something that actually can be done without law. Um, and uh, I was wondering in this case, actually, uh, just maybe to have my memory refreshed on this, does this actually go into the codified text, or it doesn't, right? It's an uncodified, it's uncodified text, right? It's an action that the council is empowered to take under uh, certain, uh, the, the authority of Article 31, Section 2.6.D, but it becomes the effect of this bill is not actually codified in law and uh, actually doesn't prohibit the, the Tr Department of Transportation from using its um, uh, regulatory authority to actually reenact these same exact regulations at any given time in the future that they may choose. Uh, there are other provisions in the law, in, in the code, uh, if, I me if memory serves me correctly, that um, says when the DOT makes certain um, parking related or also the direction of travel on one-way streets changes that the council member who represents the area where that is made, where those changes are made, has the, um, is empowered to essentially just write a letter and say, no, I reject this, and uh, the department has to undo them within, I think, 30 days or something like that. It's something to that effect. Um, but I just wanted to be clear, this doesn't actually get codified as a law. Uh, for Councilman Conway's uh, point there. Um, I just wanted thank, to make, I, I appreciate I, that. I just wanted to, and then I'll yeah. um, hear you out, um, Councilman Conway. But I just wanted to um, just add that, you know, uh, as a committee, we, we have to be very careful um, pers in perspective to our individual districts of how we handle individually the way that we um, proceed with things in respect to our constituents and um, all of us um, operate in different ways of how we get things done in our districts whether it's um, streets removing streets uh, signs um, 
get pick trash pickup, we um, are concentrated on our districts and it's always good and safe to have recorded that uh, things that come this way to a committee on a specific, for a specific council district, we must be very careful that we don't want this to be uh, automatic citywide um, approval until we talk to our prospective, um, you know, associations and constituents that we serve. So I just, th I do what I do for clarification for the people that I represent and um, hope everyone else does that as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. um, Councilman Conway. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. I just uh, want to thank the councilman for, for making that point and just want to double check with the law department um, to clarify that is the truth and how that works. That's all. Okay. Yeah. And then Councilman Stokes, you had a comment. I think I just have a um, question for Councilwoman Ramos. Is this affecting the bus lanes? One. Two is when we remove the parking restrictions, that means you're going to get a lot more traffic. My concern is now people are going to say, I ain't going back down Greenmount. Now I'm going to ride through people's neighborhood. And sometimes we're going to get the calls about why all this traffic yeah. now is coming through their neighborhood. So that's my concern also about where's that traffic now that people don't want to wait on Greenmount. They're going to find all the little side streets to go down now. And then we, as council people, myself, I'm going to get calls about why all this traffic coming through a neighborhood. So that's my concern in terms of just doing that small piece of parking restriction removed. That is going to be a concern. I know I'm going to get a phone calls from my constituents about the traffic now picking up in their neighborhood. A good point, especially when there's um, schools involved as well. It's, you know, people travel all over from from uh, different schools. Poly is a citywide school. Um, city is a citywide school. So um, we just, you know, we just have to be careful. But at this point, let's go ahead and- Madam Chair, I can answer his question just real quick. Sure. Uh -huh, thank you. Um, there are uh, no um, set bus lines on these streets. Um, so it wouldn't affect, I mean, when, I'm not like, there's no bus lane that's painted in, uh, on these streets. Um, but that's what MTA wants to, um, may want to create on Green Mount Avenue, um, which was why they had a hesitation. So that's why we're, we're having a broader conversation with Green Mount folks. Madam Chair, he wants to follow, let's do a follow up. Yes, Council. Thank you. Stokes. I just want to mention, I'm glad Councilman Ramos, because Green Mount has the highest ridership, I believe, right. in the city. That's they do. Right. So that, that bus transportation is important to people that don't have cars, that use um, public transportation. Well, Thank the MTA you. may want to put light rail there, which I'm totally in favor of, but we'll see what, how that goes. Um, and then the other piece is, um, you know, around uh, sort of cutting through, um, you know, the, I, the residents on both sides of Greenmount um, above the business area and even in the business area have asked um, for, for this. So, um, and I don't think, uh, so, on Hill and Road, they've already taken the peak parking restrictions out to allow for parking for Lake Montebello. So that has worked, um, and we didn't have um, concerns about, about that. So I, I hear what you're saying, and I, I have um, put all that into consideration, but I appreciate you bringing it up. Okay, uh, City Solicitor. The City Solicitor's Office approves for form and legal sufficiency. Thank you. And then we'll go ahead with the transportation department. And uh, you had a presentation? Yes, okay. thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Tony, do you mind pulling that up? Thank you, sir. Um, and, a, and as Tony's pulling that up, I just want to reference um, or acknowledge that on the actual Legistar page, the original presentation from our first bill hearing is on there. And that includes on page six, um, or excuse me, I can get the exact page number for you. Um, but within that report is the matrix where we actually evaluate these corridors. So I want to be clear, this isn't done like kind of randomly or happenstance. There's been a lot of thought 
um, from the Department of Transportation into these um, decisions and, and these recommendations. Um, so as we get started, I do want to mention Liam Davis, Legislative Affairs Manager for City Department of Transportation. I'm also joined by Mr. James Turner, who is a policy analyst with us at DOT as well. Um, so as we get this presentation started, I don't know if this is working. There we go. So I think we know what corridors we're looking at, but let's look at the impact um, of each corridor. We can go one by one. So when we're looking at 33rd Street, this is an area that um, MTA has highlighted to us as, as a concern from the standpoint of potentially removing the peak hour parking. And that's because during peak hour times, this is a corridor that has, on average, 15 buses going through it every hour. So there's significant amount of um, bus traffic, City Link Silver, Local Link 22, that's using this corridor. When we look at Hill and Road, that's an area where, and we'll get into this, where there, it made sense to remove the peak hour restrictions because there's no bus lines on it. Um, so again, where there's no transit service, we're totally open to removing the peak hour restrictions, giving the residents a little bit more parking and then implementing a degree of, of traffic calming. Um, so that's something where we were reasonable. And the Alameda, 33 through 3,500 blocks. This is an area that technically does have a good amount of bus traffic, City Link Green, City Link Silver, Local Link 53. There are 14 buses per hour during peak hours. However, it is a shorter route. It's only a few blocks, and it's something where you know, MTA wasn't too crazy about it, but we're trying to find compromise. We're trying to find middle ground. We always try and work with our council offices and work with our communities to find wins, but it's a, it's a balancing act to be um, transparent. Then when we look at Lock Raven Boulevard, 2,500 through 3,200 block, again, it really has limited bus service, express bus link 103, um, two buses per hour during peak hours. Um, there's only one block um, one actually side of the street on one block where we didn't implement the peak hour restriction removal and that was due to a variation roadway width. Um, but the rest of the corridor, we followed the wishes of Councilwoman Ramos and the communities and we've already removed those restrictions. Looking at Greenmount, as a number of folks here have mentioned, the 2900 block through 4300 block, City Link Red, as folks have noted, that is the busiest bus line consistently in the region. Um, and just as a reminder, Baltimore, the Baltimore region has one of the highest utilized bus services in the country. Pre-COVID, we averaged routinely over 200,000 weekday riders a day. We also know that on the bus system uh, during the school year, 27,000 school students rely on MTA to get to and from school. And when you impact one bus line, it has a cascading effect on the entire system. So when you delay a bus by five minutes on one corridor, it could lead to further delay for a student getting to school on a transfer. So we're talking about kids who might not get to school on time, or people who might not get to work on time, or elderly people who need to get their prescription meds or go to the doctor. So there is a significant impact. We're talking about at minimum in the tens of thousands of people. Um, and we also know, looking at Greenmount Corridor, it's a link between two, if, you, if you're just looking at between downtown and the Towson area, two critical job clusters. You have the major university and medical institutions in Towson, and we all know um, the importance of downtown Baltimore and the, and the neighborhoods that are along that corridor. Um, that being said, um, working with the mayor's office and working with the councilwoman's office, we did acknowledge there was some room for compromise in the Waverly Main Street area. So south of, oh, excuse me, uh, south of, um, south of um, 33rd Street in the Main Street area is where we would be willing to, to remove those restrictions. And um, I do also want to mention, when we're looking at Falls Road, that's an area where we're also 3,600 3, block through 4,400 block, there is local link 94. 
we talked with MTA and there, there's only three buses typically per hour during peak hour, we were comfortable to remove the restrictions there as well. So again, it's something where we're trying to find compromise, we're trying to find a way to keep the communities happy, keep the businesses happy, but also make sure we're not, we're not adversely impacting this critical service to um, Baltimoreans. Um, and this, this chart you see up here is just more of a summary in terms of what has been completed, what hasn't, and what's not feasible. So again, when we look at 33rd Street Corridor, because of those number of buses per hour, we haven't completed it, and, our, and we are recommending that the restrictions not be removed. When we look at Hill and Road, that has been completed. When we look at the Alameda, we're willing to work with the councilwoman's wishes and do the peak hour restriction removal there. Lock Raven Boulevard, largely completed with the exception of the 3200 block northbound side due to a roadway variation width, or a variation with roadway width. Green Mount Avenue, we just summarized. Uh, Main Street area, we're willing to work with, with um, the community and the councilwoman's office. North of 33rd is gonna be more problematic. Um, Falls Road, again, that's where we are gonna be a bit more um, you know, willing to, to work there. So this is just a sample of East 33rd. Um, you can see um, where people in this image are currently parked during a peak hour restriction. Um, when it's in effect, those cars should technically not be there. And that's enforced by our um, traffic enforcement officers operating out of our safety division, and if need be, towed away by our towing division. Whoops, here's Hill and Road. Um, Hill and Road, again, um, the, the restriction signage has been removed, and now residents are free to park here essentially 24-7. Here's the Alameda, where there is a decent amount of bus service. You can actually see a bus in the picture. Um, however, we are willing to compromise here, remove the restriction, and allow um, parking on the corridor. Next is 2500 to 3200 blocks of Lock Raven Boulevard. Here's an idea of what that looks like. Um, again, similar makeup, uh, four lane road, two lane northbound, two lane southbound. Um, we do, when we were having our meeting with our traffic division and um, MTA and the mayor's office, we were actually looking at this specific area and seeing if there was something creative we could do adjacent to the school. Here's Greenmount. Um, the beautifully re recently streetscaped green mount. Um, and again, this is where we're seeing a significant amount of important uh, bus service, uh, the busiest bus line in the region. Next is Falls Road going through Hamden here. Um, we are willing to remove the restrictions. And that's pretty much it. We're open to questions. Um, I do want to say again, just before we wrap, wrap up the presentation, um, we can finalize this discussion with you, Councilwoman, but as far as timeline, uh, Sign Shop is saying that we can have the peak hour restriction signage removed on the corridors where we've agreed to it. They can be removed within 10 business days. Um, our commitment to your office, Councilwoman, is that we will inform your office within two days of the re restricted signage being removed. And then in working with um, the mayor's office of government relations, um, we've committed to working with the CAO's office to set up a briefing with the councilwoman's office, NMTA, and DOT within 60 days of this memo being drafted. Oh, excuse me, 30, 30 days. And that's it for DOT. Thank you. So it sounds like you have a, a time frame, timeline in uh, at, that was requested. Um, is there anything you want to add from the mayor's office perspective? Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I think the only thing that I can really highlight and emphasize is how diligently DOT has worked through this process at this point uh, to be collaborative and to be good faith partners with the councilwoman. However, we have to ensure that any changes on our streets and on our roads that we take into account all of the potential impacts that may happen 
as a cause of the change. And what you heard here was pretty simple, and it is that we want to be able to partner with council people when they have these types of concerns and changes that they want to make, but that we also want to ensure that we are being responsible uh, and that we can be nimble and work with our partners at MTA, at MDOT, so that we can ensure that there's minimal impact to such a vital service, and that is the buses that keep this city running, that move our residents from point A to point B. That's all we're asking for, and we're asking for the ability, again, to have our partners conduct their study, bring us the results, and then we can go from there and look at what else can happen north and south of Greenmount and even on 33rd Street. So thank you. Thank you. Any other comments or questions from the committee? Um, Council Member uh, Dorsey, excuse me. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I think I just need to put on the record uh, I think that the numbers here are actually really misleading and the way that this conversation is actually being framed um, is really misleading in terms of um, buses being the priority here. I, I think that it's really convenient to use bus riders as your reason to not want to change parking restrictions, but the numbers here unless I'm reading this incorrectly, this says potential bus riders affected, meaning during peak hours. So that's over a two or two and a half hour period, potential bus riders, that's nine buses. And it also says estimated peak hour vehicles per hour, 665 cars per hour. So over that, the course of that peak hours that we get nine buses through there, we get more than 1,300 cars. We're giving the buses a completely disproportionately outsized sense of representation in this conversation here. The buses are not what are being affected here. It's the volume of cars that we're moving. And this is in direct contradiction to what the Complete Streets Ordinance requires of us as our modal hierarchy of concerns. That I can tell you, because we did this already in my district, we removed peak hours parking restrictions along Hartford Road and it served our number one hierarchy of priority of pedestrian safety as the first and foremost uh, beneficial outcome of doing this. And I just happen to think that anybody who's walking down uh, any street at any given time is better off if there's a car parked between them and cars traveling down city streets where drivers are often erratic and unsafe and unlawfully operating motor vehicles at uh, speed limits above, you know, posted speed limit, uh, at speeds above posted speed limits, taking turns without stopping or even hardly slowing down, taking turns in an illegal manner. We have all kinds of crazy driving that's happening out there all the time, but it is, you know, it, we're talking about, if we're talking about 486 people on buses, that's on nine vehicles that occur, that move in the time of 1,300 other cars. It is truly the cars that, w that, are, that are creating any sort of problem. I also want to note that by having multiple lanes of travel, all of the science, all of the data, like there, there's no debate on this in the world of transportation planning and engineering, all of the evidence shows that that volume of cars comes as, in, in large part as a result of having multiple lanes for car travel. That if we didn't have two tra travel lanes for cars in the first place, if we only had one and a parking lane, we would have a dramatically reduced volume of cars coming down any one of these streets in the first place. And um, that you know the, the volume of cars being the first um, number one cause of delays in travel that are non-recurring, uh, is, uh, or, or, uh, it, the, the number two cause is crashes that are dramatically reduced. Crashes as a result of creating too much space for cars to travel in an irresponsible, erratic, and unsafe manner. Uh, these are the real causes of traffic delays. 
Um, and so I think that it, you know, it needs to be a, a acknowledged that by having two lanes of traffic, we are actually creating more delay than we might have if we had uh, only one lane of traffic. And so, and, and, and that's been evidenced plenty of other places. I think that needs to be on the record. And I appreciate taking the having the opportunity to be able to say that. Transportation, do you want to comment? Yeah, I appreciate it, Madam Chair, and I appreciate the Councilman's feedback. I do want to be clear, um, a lot of these concerns that we're echoing today have been shared with us by MDOT MTA. Last time I checked, MDOT MTA was not in the business of advocating for single occupancy vehicles. And um, they're looking at these corridors as opportunities for fu future dedicated bus lane um, and rapid transit enhancements. We have to keep that in mind. That's a long-term benefit for our riders that will result in a travel lane reduction for single occupancy vehicles. And it's easy to say, well, this is only nine buses or this is only 15 buses. But whether it's an extended bus or your standard bus, there's dozens of riders on those buses and there are people who oftentimes can't afford a car. Not to mention, Councilman, I could um, make the argument that by giving these lanes to single occupancy vehicles for parking, that runs counter to the Complete Streets Ordinance. Thank you. I just want to add, um, after that fiasco with um, the light rail breaking down and uh, all those folks had to uh, ride bus, they had to get, uh, MTA had to get their bus, buses moving. It just kind of showed the importance of um, how we need uh, total transportation with whether it's buses, light rail, our whole system really n needs to be revamped and uh, really looked at. And, um, uh, and I'll leave that set there. Any other comments? So um, just listening to, you know, all the comments and as we're moving forward, there still, there seems to still be work that has to be done. And I'm feeling that we need to hold this vote until we get some of those um, uh, timelines. You mentioned timelines and um, I think that's what Councilwoman Ramos was looking for some uh, concrete timeline. Um, you seem to have compromised with some things that are going to change immediately, even without this um, bill being moved uh, so, you know, right at this moment. And um, uh, you want to have some final comments because I think we want to hold the vote. Uh, correct. I don't okay. plan on voting this out. We do have people um, online for testimony. But, oh, yes. Yeah. So um, there were some people. We checked, and there's no in-person uh, people here to testify. But we do have some online testimony, and we'll go ahead and start with that. So uh, raise, raise your hand if you want to vote or you're here, here two beeps and uh, say your name and then you'll, you can go ahead and testify. And we have a raised hand first. Emily Agunda. Sorry if I pronounced your last name wrong. 4300 block of Falls Road. You're on, hello. Emily? Forgive me. Ooh. Emily? Hello? Hi, you're on. Do you have testimony you for the uh, restricted parking? Yes, uh, my name is Emily Agata, and I live in the greater Hose Heights area. I uh, just wanted to call that out since Hose Heights continually gets missed in these conversations that affect the Hamden Medfield area. And we live right at the gateway of our neighborhood and continually lose the ability to have a voice here because our community leaders aren't mentioned. 
for things like that. So I thank you for allowing me to be here. I have uh, lived on Falls Road for over 20 years and have two alarms set on my phone so I can remember to move my car without suffering a penalty for exceeding the peak flow time and um, potentially getting towed. And the folks that live around me you know, we basically have like a vigilante group because we're human and we forget and have to move our cars. Um, and, you know, I don't think that really speaks to the issue that here at the um, intersection of Cold Spring and Falls Road, the opening of peak flow lanes um, presents a hazard to the people that live here. Uh, cars um, deem this opening of lanes for rush hour flow as a license to increase their speed and speed through the neighborhood. Um, we continually um, hear cars trying to beat the lights, um, accelerating um, to get to the light at Cold Spring or through um, onto Hamden and South. And um, we've requested measures like traffic calming through speed bumps, um, speed uh, lights and other things, but haven't seen those things. Uh, come through. So I think by uh, removing peak flow parking, as Councilman Dorsey stated, we will have the natural um, propensity of uh, traffic to slow down because of the reduction of lanes. So I appreciate him saying that. And I also think it's important to say that um, I do agree that there has been a really abundant failure of mentioning that there are people here, people in the buses, people that live here, people that don't have the ability to cross the street because the cars that come through uh, always exceed the 25 mile per hour speed limit and don't give any regard to the folks that live here and are just trying to conduct their day to day lives on foot in the neighborhood. And um, I think that's all I have to say. Thank you for the time. Thank you for your testimony and uh, where you're announcing where you're from because we want to make sure that we're moving forward with um, residents uh, giving their testimony. Next, Christina Diamond. Christina Diamond. Christina Diamond, you're on. Can you hear us? Uh, yes, I can. Um, good, good afternoon, everyone. I am also a resident of the 4300 block of Falls Road. Um, you know, representing me and Emily representing uh, Hose Heights. And I've been in the neighborhood eight years now. And I mean, the parking situation is not that great. I mean, I come home from class um, during the semester at nine o'clock at night. But then I have to move my car every morning before I, on the days when I can, can walk to work. I work down on the avenue at 36th Street, but I'm still having to like move my car before, like to actually drive before I walk to work. And on 42nd Street, the 42nd hundred block of Falls Road, they, the signs are removed. So when people during peak hours are coming through the intersection of Falls and Roland Heights, they are going like 50 to get into two different lanes. And it really makes it very difficult for p students from Medfield um, Heights Elementary School, from Roland Heights um, Elementary Middle School, who are trying to cross the street at four o'clock. I mean, I've seen little kids almost get hit by people trying to go around other people just to get into that second lane. Whereas if there were cars there, it would be much safer for everyone. Um, so yeah, I really hope that something can be done about this because people are going 80 at 4.30 in the afternoon down Falls Road, going towards um, Poly High School where there are still students at corners waiting for buses and walking to wherever they need to go. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Shannon, oh. Shannon um, Ackerson. Shannon Ackerson. Hello. Hi, you're on. Hi, yeah. So I also live in the 4300 block of Falls Road on the Medfield side. 
Um, and I actually work at the elementary school, uh, Medfield Heights Elementary School. And my biggest concern, which of course, piggybacking off my neighbors, is the kids. And I've been watching this for over 15 years with my own children. Uh, my niece and nephew live across the street. They went to Medfield, they went to Roland Park, and they also went to Poly. And even as teenagers, we had a hard time allowing them to cross the streets because it couldn't be done safely or even walk down Falls Road. Like I would drive my son from here to Polly because I did not want him, you know, potentially getting hit. But watching with them changing our school hours that we are now later, you know, we go till 3.40, our hours are nine to 3.40. Those coincide with peak hours, which means the people are picking up speed and there is no crossing guard here to us. I mean, yes, parents are with them, but that's besides the point. So. And some of them are walkers, but these kids are trying to, elementary school kids trying to cross a street where people are going 56. Like, I don't wanna cross the street as a grown adult. And again, like, I also should not have to park on a side street when I have ample parking out front of my house later at night with the crime rate uptick and have to walk, you know, from side streets or the alley or wherever to my home when there's ample parking out front, but I can't park there because my work hours don't allow me to, you know, I have to move my car. So ultimately, like a lot of this parking needs to be removed, but definitely in this block. Thank you and for your been. testimony. Thank you. Kevin Kramer. Kevin Kramer. Uh, oh. Kevin Kramer. Kevin Kramer, we have you, oops, try again. Uh, good afternoon. Kevin Kramer. Uh, my name's, am Hello. I coming through? Kevin? Kevin sound Kramer. There you go. Can you hear us? I can hear you, can you hear me? Please give your testimony. Yes, um, I'm a resident of the 3900 block of, of Green Mount um, and a member of the Guilford Neighborhood Association. Um, I just wanted to share, uh, uh, Councilwoman um, Ramos has, has been engaging uh, uh, the residents along the corridor. And um, one of the things I just want to call to attention is that some of these safety concerns are, are not hypothetical. Um, we've had a resident um, who a car plowed through the fence in front of their home. Um, several residents whose cars have been hit uh, as people have been swerving to navigate around the bus. Um, and in the absence of a bus lane, um, it produces just a very unsafe environment right now. So, uh, you know, I'm optimistic as a resident of the neighborhood in some of the further reaching plans that are being discussed here. Um, but the, the plan that, that Councilman Ramos is putting forward um, that has been talked about with many of the residents along the way um, represents a solution for the, the current situation. Um, which is that it's unsafe for folks lining up for the bus right now. It's unsafe for the residents along Greenmount uh, in those York uh, uh, court homes. Um, so uh, the association has written a letter of uh, support to that effect, but uh, wanted to vocalize that here as well. Thank you for your testimony. Aretha, oh. I think that's it. Well, it looks like we have all the online testimony completed, and it looks like um, transportation has some unfinished work. It, uh, so it looks like transportation has some unfinished work. If there, is there any final things you want to say after you've heard this testimony? Yeah, I think this is, it's great that the public is here and, and um, providing their testimony, especially the people from Hose Heights and Falls Road Corridor. I think um, the thing I want to make clear, that's one of the corridors that we identified as being ripe for restriction removal. Okay. So I think that's some great news for them. For Kevin, I've worked with Kevin on some stuff in uh, Councilman Conway's district, and uh, I know that's taken a while, Kevin, but 
we're going to get there. And I know MTA is really uh, excited about their future plans for Greenmount Avenue corridor. I know that <laughs> people are probably tired of me saying this, but we ask for people's patience. We are going to have some results. What I was just telling Tyler from uh, Mayor's Office and uh, Mayor's Office of Government Relations is we're going to huddle, likely before this end of the week, get our operations people moving on getting the restriction signage removed that we agreed to, and we can continue to have this conversation. Sound good? Sounds, sounds like a plan. Thank you. Uh, any final words um, before we go into, oh, um, yes, city solicitor's office? Thank you. I just wanted to respond to Councilman Conway's question. Um, the council has authority to make stopping and parking restrictions on streets, and you have to act by ordinance. But if you look at the bill, you're not adding any code section or amending a code section. This is uncodified law. Okay, that's important. Okay, at this point, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, any final words, Councilwoman yeah. Ramos? Um, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, committee members, for um, uh, participating in this dialogue. Um, it's a very, as you could tell, a very important issue for my um, residents, and um, I look forward to further, um, you know, talking about that Greenmount Corridor and the 33rd Street Corridor, because those are the two unresolved. The rest have been uh, done um, or as promised to be done um, in the memo that was sent uh, to me by the mayor's office, which I'll make sure is on the bill file so it's all public. Um, and uh, so I um, look forward to that further dialogue and hopefully that this was helpful for all of you colleagues if you're interested in doing something like this in your districts, you know, how to um, move forward with, with DOT. So um, again, thanks very much, uh, Madam Chair, for scheduling this hearing and um, for my colleagues for being a part of the, of the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, and I, so I think we're comfortable in going in a recess as we um, move forward and uh, many of these uh, tasks and initiatives are completed within the 14th district. Thank you. Thank you.